The Peter Schiff Show. This is Peter Schiff, and I am talking with my guest, Charles Blauhaus, who is a trustee for Social Security and Medicare. And so I want to talk a little bit about the actual actuarially solvency of Social Security. First of all, uh, Charles, do, do you know what a Ponzi scheme is? <laughs> I do indeed. Okay, so could you describe to me the difference between Social Security and a Ponzi scheme? Well, I would say this. Uh, the... The difference is largely one of intent. I mean, obviously, a Ponzi scheme, you have something of an intent to defraud. Um, but there are well, I'm not talking about the plan. intent. I'm talking about what it actually is. I mean, right. how well, a Ponzi think, scheme I, is financed. Is there a difference between the way a Ponzi scheme is financed oh, and the way Social Security is financed? Well, there's certainly strong similarities. I mean, in But is there a difference? Is, what's the, is there any difference? Um... I, <laughs> I, well, that, the only see, I can answer the question. The only difference is you're required to participate in this Ponzi scheme, whereas private Ponzi schemes are voluntary. But the fact of the matter is, just because the government mandates everybody participate doesn't ma doesn't validate a Ponzi scheme. It doesn't make it work. Joining me now is Andrew Biggs, who is a former principal deputy commissioner of the Social Security Administration. He also was the American Enterprise Institute resident scholar since 2008. In 2005, he worked on the Social Security reform at the White House National Economic Council. 2000 and was on the staff of President's Commission to Strengthen Social Security. He's also been a Social Security analyst for the Cato Institute from 1999 to 2003. Andrew, welcome to the show. Hey, good to be with you. Thanks very much for having me. Hey, thanks for being on. It seems like you've spent a lot of time on the Social Security issue so maybe you can answer for me this one question, because I had one of the trustees on, and he really couldn't come up with an answer. So maybe you can enlighten us, because you've got a lot of experience here. So can you explain to me the difference between Social Security and a Ponzi scheme? <laughs> well, um... I know Ponzi it's a tough question, but I don't know if you can come up with it. I yeah, don't want to hate to put you on the spot. <laughs> Well, I mean, both, both are essentially uh, transfer programs. Um, I, I guess that the difference would be technically, I mean, a Ponzi scheme would promise a rate of return which is mathematically impossible to produce. Social Security uh, can keep going, in, in essence, by cutting the rate of return you get. I mean, Social Security will be a much worse deal for people retiring 50 years from now than it was people retiring 50 years ago. So in, in that sense, it's sustainable in a way a Ponzi scheme isn't, but it's sustainable by virtue of paying people in the future a, a poorer deal or a so, poorer rate So basically you're saying it, it works because it rips everybody off who comes in later on. They don't, they don't, they don't get what they think they're going to get. Well, I mean, the, the issue with Social Security was it was an incredibly good deal for early participants in the program. I mean, people... Uh, but isn't you know, that they, true of all Ponzi schemes? The people who get in early, they get a great deal? They make out sure. because of the people no, who no, come I, in no, later? I, I, don't, I don't deny that at all. I mean, the, 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 the early participants received something like $17 trillion more in benefits than they paid in taxes. So Social Security is a little bit like a seesaw. If one end of the, the sort of the ladder got a very, very good deal, it means people in the future are going to pay $17 trillion more in taxes than they'll receive in benefits. Right. And I mean, so isn't that, isn't that what happened with, with Madoff? I mean, there were a lot of people in the Madoff scheme that got in early that made a lot of money off of, that, off of the fact that suckers came in later on. Isn't that the same dynamic at Social Security, that all the money that our grandparents made is going to equal all the losses that our grandchildren suffer? Isn't that how it oh, works? Sure. No, it, it all has to net out. The problem is there's no way out of it. Um, you know, people say, well, Social Security pays a poor rate of return. Let's go to a private system. That will pay you a higher rate of return. It, it doesn't, and unfortunately, it doesn't work that way because the, that $17 trillion is gone. Yes. It's, it's money that you're never going to get back, but that's just how these programs work. Well, the problem is they don't work. I mean, they're, they're, I agree there's no way out of it other than to end it, which is, the mo which is the best thing to do. I mean, I mean, Ponzi schemes are illegal for a reason. They're illegal because they don't work. And if they, if they don't work in the private sector, they don't work in the public sector. So to try to orchestrate on a federal level something that Bernie Madoff failed in doing makes no sense as a national policy. Don't you think it would make more sense 
to, to admit that it's a Ponzi scheme. It's not a funded retirement account the way Roosevelt sold it to the American public, and we need to put an end to it? Well, you should be, you should be clear of what it is and what it isn't. It clearly isn't a funded uh, pension program. You don't have an account with your name on it. At the same time, though, the ending it will not get rid of the of the seventeen trillion dollar loss to current and future participants. Oh That's no! I mean, there's no way to deal. there's no way to get that money back. The question is, we've already blown seventeen what whatever trillion whatever that is. Why do we have to keep losing money? What, can't we acknowledge it's a mistake and then and then stop digging the hole deeper and just get out from under this thing? Well, the question, I mean, at the end of the day, again, you're not, the $17 trillion is what it is. You're not going, you can't make it less, but you can't make it deeper as well. Uh, somebody has to bear that cost. And the question for Social Security reform, unfortunately, is who does it? Uh, mm-hmm. How is the cost borne over time? How is it borne across people with different income levels? There are good reasons to have a Social Security program that a lot of people, if, you know, I wish I could think of one. <laughs> Well, no, lacking Social Security, a good number of people would, would not save for retirement. When they get to retirement, we're living in a democracy, they'll vote themselves a benefit at the cost of the responsible people who did save. But the problem so is, you know, the government... universal program helps both ends of it. But the problem is the government didn't save any of the money. So the government said we need Social Security because Americans won't save. And then the government took the money and spent every nickel of it. I mean, the gov- the, at least the public... No, you're, no you're, you're, you're totally right that, um, that especially for the past 25 years or so, the Social Security surpluses have subsidized consumption and the rest of the budget, and so we're no better off today for having done and, that. And meanwhile, at least when Roosevelt first started Social Security, they exempted the self-employed because they figured if you're smart enough to be self-employed, you're smart enough to save your retirement. Now the government is forcing you know, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett to pay into Social Security. I mean, obviously, clearly... They're smart enough to save for their own retirement. Why do they have to be forced into Social Security? Well, the, the original proposal for Social Security from Roosevelt's Committee on Economic Security said that anybody with earnings above a certain cap, about three times the average, wouldn't even participate in the program. So there would be no question of it being a, a welfare program that took money from the very rich and gave it to the poor. Now the, the sort of push for folks on the left who claim to be defenders of the traditional program is to go more and more after the high-income people. That's not how the system was originally set up. And I think you know, people just need to keep in mind, what do we want this thing to do? Yeah, well, I think right now, I think the best thing to do is to try to take care of the people who unfortunately put their trust in government and didn't save for their retirement, mainly because of the moral hazard of Social Security, try to put them on welfare, but people who uh, did save and people who have wealth, I mean, right now the Social Security system is a, is a transfer from the young and the poor to the old and the rich. You have a lot of young people uh, paying an enormous burden, especially when you add what their employer pays, which is really coming out of their wages. Uh, young people today are paying a huge amount in tax, and they're going to pay even more if we try to keep these promises to the earlier generation. I don't think that the people who were never even born when Social Security was, was around, I don't think they should be the ones that are stuck holding the bag.